Just come in and get a seat. Make yourselves at home. It's lovely to see you this morning. My name's Chris Gordon. I'm a trainee minister, and Ben invited me to come along today. He's off on holiday. And I'm here with my wife, Becca, and James and Lilla, and we were blessed to be part of this fellowship for about eight years, from, I think, 2006, maybe, to 2014. And it helped to shape us being here. It helped to shape us individually, helped to shape us as a couple, and then it helped to shape us as a family. We were very blessed by the discipleship we experienced here. And that kind of discipleship was really precious. It's something that we'll be touching on within God's Word today. So I'm glad you're here. It's lovely to see people in person, and I know there's others joining us online. You're very welcome to. Because we all make a choice to come and worship, we've all given up things to come this morning, and so thank you for being with us. And I pray it'll be a time of blessing to you as we lift our hearts to God, we lift our minds to Him, and now we're going to lift our voices as we sing the first song today, To God Be the Glory. Let's worship God together. Let's pray together now. 
Almighty God and loving Father, we thank you that we can gather together today to praise you. And we ask that you would take our hearts this morning and renew them. Take our minds so that we can understand the truths of Scripture that prepare us to meet with you. We thank you, Lord, that even though we sometimes keep you at a distance, that you're not put off. You continue to pursue us. You are the hound of heaven, Lord, not resting until we have come to know you, to know your embrace and your peace. Father, we name in our hearts the times this last week when we have failed to trust you, the times we have doubted your sovereignty. Please, would you give us hearts that are quick to turn to you and to remind ourselves of the promises that we find in your word, that you are faithful, that you alone are righteous, that you preserve us according to your will, and that you bring light into our darkness. And that wrapped around all this is your love which spans our world from east to west and from north to south. Have mercy on us today, Lord. Help us to experience that mercy, to embrace it, and to be thankful for it. Help us to know the grace you offer us, the good gifts we don't deserve. Help us to receive that grace, to name it and proclaim it. Father God, we thank you for sending your Son, and that through him the very transgressions we have just named in our hearts are removed from us and that we are made clean, able to approach you and worship you. Help us to delight in the promise that one day we will see you and know your touch. So come Holy Spirit, help us to worship this morning, to shed all that we carry and to bring ourselves afresh to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. So if we could put up the first slide, please. I know that Ben often kicks off with a quiz. Now, I'm not a quiz master like Ben, but I have got one question for you this morning. And it's, I wonder if you recognize this guy here. Um, I'm guessing most of you don't, but some of you might. And the reason you might is that a couple of weeks ago, he achieved something really significant. And as a result, his face was on a few back pages and online as well. His name is Dave Riding, and he's been a ski racer for about 20 years or so. And a couple of weeks ago, he achieved something no other Brit had done before. He won a World Cup ski race, and that's a big deal. It was a big deal to me. I love skiing, so I was very excited. And it was a big deal for Britain because, let's face it, we're not really an alpine nation. We've got some hills up north, we've got some curling rinks, but we couldn't lay claim to being one of the best, not compared to the likes of Austria or France or Switzerland. We've got Ben Nevis, but they've got Mont Blanc. And on years like this, there's been almost no snow in Britain, and we saw that this morning, certainly in Strathlane, it was trying, but there was nothing really happening. But if you grow up in one of those European countries and you show promise in alpine sports, you receive amazing support and funding from a very early age so that you can be fast-tracked as a kind of elite athlete. That wasn't the case for Dave here. No, he grew up in the north of England. He grew up racing on that slope that you can see in Pendle in the north of England. Just like the one out at Bears Den or Bella Houston, Look at that funny kind of bristly stuff that's really horrible to ski on. But he kept going. He didn't even ski on snow until he was 12, by which time most of his peers had been in those elite programs and competing in international competitions. But he kept plugging away, funding his own training, sleeping in the back of a van as he traveled around the Alps. He persevered even when the going was really tough. And in the last couple of years, he's come close to winning. He got a couple of second places, which are very exciting. And he might have been content with that and just said, well, I'll retire now. After all, I'm, I'm getting on a bit. 
because he's 35 and his rivals are about 20. But he's still competing. He's still striving to win the race. If you could flick the next slide, please. Now, this is a still that I grabbed from the BBC iPlayer. Not absolutely sure you're allowed to do that, but I've done it anyway. Um, and it's the moment that he pushes out of the start gate. And I was watching this with my family because I watch it every, every Sunday. And at that moment when you're in the start gate, there's lots of people around, there's coaches, and people are trying to say encouraging, motivational things. And you can hear it really clearly, his last words to himself are, come on, discipline. And that struck me at the time. I thought, what a funny thing to say. What a kind of odd thing to say. To G yourself up for a race. Surely there's more motivational things that you could say. I've got this, or stay strong. But no. He said, discipline. And I think what he's getting at is to put his training into practice. To put all the good habits to the forefront of his mind, all the things he'd been working on, and discard those things which had been getting in the way, those things which had slowed him down or caused him to fall in previous races. And I know you'll be exploring that down in Sunday school today, the training that you do to prepare for a race. And up here, we're going to be looking, for, looking at aspects of discipline too, so you can share notes as a family later on. But before you do that, let me show you one final slide. So that's him at the end of the race, and he's celebrating. But at that moment, he didn't actually know he'd won. There were still five guys to go, and they could all beat him because they'd all had a quicker time in the first run. His delight at that point was that he'd stayed the course that he'd been disciplined and cut out the bad habits. And in doing that, it had given him the best chance to compete and to win the prize. And as it happens, the five guys were either slower, a couple of them fell over, and so he did win. And now he's in China for the Winter Olympics. And there's, it's going to be great. I hope you get a chance to watch some of it. Keep an eye on other people too. There's a girl from Aberdeen called Kirsty Muir. And she's the youngest athlete ever to represent Great Britain at the Winter Olympics. She's still at school. And I watched an interview with her dad the other day, and he was the usual proud dad, but he was so clear on what he thought her success was down to. And again, he said, she's so disciplined. She's either training or doing her homework, and she's thriving at school and in her sport. So if you can, have a wee look at the Winter Olympics. There's some wonderfully ridiculous sports on there that are worth keeping an eye out for. And maybe there's a future Dave Riding or Kirsty Muir among us. But for now, we're going to sing again the song, Jesus Messiah. Because Jesus had a task to do too. He had a course set out for him, and it led to a cross. And there his life was a ransom for you and for me. So let's praise him now as we sing together, Jesus Messiah.
Let's pray together again. Father God, yeah, we come before you this morning and we bring you our worries and concerns. We ask for your peace to come into our hearts and that we would remain in you and trust in you and your ways. We thank you for your word this morning as we approach it and help us to know that it's in scripture that we read of your character that you're gracious and compassionate, that you're slow to anger, overflowing with love and faithfulness. And help us to go out into the world this week with that truth in our hearts and minds. Father, we pray for those who are ill, some for an extended time. Lord, let them know your presence and comfort and bring healing in accordance with your will. We pray for all those caring for others, the thousands who quietly serve their relatives and friends, bringing them neighborly love and kindness. And then the thousands more who work in our hospitals, 
doctor surgeries and care homes, striving to do their best in challenging circumstances. Lord, may they know your provision and enabling. Lord, for all those aspiring to lead at these times, when no amount of qualification or experience is sufficient to navigate a world that fluctuates so rapidly, Holy Spirit, please come upon those in offices of responsibility and may they know your wisdom. And we pray that this time, this time of uncertainty might be a time of humbling, that we would all have an increased awareness that we are the created and you are the creator. Father, we pray for peace in parts of the world where there is strife and we pray for diplomacy in Ukraine just now. We pray that people would choose a path of peace and subdue their own desires. Father God, we bring these petitions to you and the silent ones of our heart in the name of the Lord Jesus who taught us how to pray together as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we sing our next song, we're conscious that we are in no way the finished article. We are to be sharpened by God's spirit and his word, creating in us a pure heart that desires to know him and to worship him. So let's sing together now, Purify My Heart. A massive thanks as well to the praise band. That was beautiful. Um, thanks also to Tony and Ada who are helping out with the tech at the back. I'm guessing this morning 
there might be one or two teachers among us, maybe also some others who are involved in clubs or groups for younger people. And there'll be some parents too, mums and dads, grannies and granddads, aunts and uncles. And I'm imagining that when you set out to be a teacher or a parent, you had some hopes and dreams. You were going to make learning interesting. You're going to be a fun mum or dad. You're going to inspire young people to be the best that they can be. In contrast, I doubt your primary aim was to achieve a reputation as a disciplinarian. It's not really the title that you're aiming for, is it, to be known as the strict one? When I found out I was going to be a dad, I didn't lie in bed at night imagining how to give my kids timeouts or set boundaries for them. No, I was going to be a cool, fun dad. We'd go on adventures and we'd have a great time. And yet when the task becomes real, when people look to you for direction and guidance to create boundaries that ensure their safety, discipline is a key part of showing a person that you love them. Because love is many things, but it must include holding people to account and creating safe places for them. That has to be true of our churches too. And our passage today speaks into that situation in Corinth. So let's read together from God's Word. When in 1 Corinthians, Ben was going through a series in 1 Corinthians, and we're going to be reading chapters 4 and 5. Uh, they're quite, quite a long passage, so strap yourself in. So then, men ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the secret things of God. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. I care very little if I'm judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait till the Lord comes. He will bring light. He will bring to light what is hidden in the darkness and will expose the motives of men's hearts. At that time, each will receive his praise from God. Now, brothers, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, do not go beyond what is written. Then you will not take pride in one man over against another. For who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? Already you have what you want, already you've become rich. You have become kings and that without us. How I wish you really had become kings so that we might be kings with you. For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession, like men condemned to die in the arena. We've been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as to men. We are fools for Christ, but you are so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honored, we are dishonored. To this very hour, we go hungry and thirsty. We are in rags. We are brutally treated. We are homeless. We work hard with our own hands. When we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. Up to this moment, we have become the scum of the earth, the refuse of the world. I am not writing this to shame you. But to warn you, as my dear children, even though you have 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. For this reason, I'm sending you to Timothy, my son whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. Some of you have become arrogant, as if I were not coming to you, but I will come to you very soon if the Lord is willing, and then I will find out not only how those arrogant people are talking, but what power they have. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. 
what do you prefer? Shall I come to you with a whip or in love and with a gentle spirit? It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that does not even occur among pagans. A man has his father's wife and you are proud? Shouldn't you rather have been filled with grief and have put out of your fellowship the man who did this? Even though I'm not physically present, I'm with you in spirit and I have already passed judgment on the one who did this, just as if I were present. When you're assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus and I am with you in spirit and the power of the Lord Jesus is present, hand this man over to Satan so that the sinful nature may be destroyed and his spirit saved on the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast that you may be a new batch without yeast as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival, not with the old yeast, the yeast of malice and wickedness, but with the bread without yeast, the bread of sincerity and truth. I have written to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral, or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you'd have to leave this world. But now I'm writing to you, that you must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother, but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater or a slanderer, a drunkard or a swindler. With such a man, do not even eat. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked man from among you. Amen. Lord, help us to understand your word today. Could we just go to that first slide, please, Ada? So here we are in Corinth, where we were last week as well. And it's to a dysfunctional church. There's divisions of all kinds. There's misunderstandings on what the role of leadership is. And there's a legacy of idolatry that they just can't shake off. And there's issues of immorality. And amidst all that, Paul is writing to them to remind them of the things that he's already told them a few years earlier when he was with them. He is clarifying the change that we anticipate when the Holy Spirit begins a process of sanctification. A process that we participate in as we throw off our old way of living to become followers of Christ. Let's remember the church in Corinth was young and it was raw. It wasn't a tradition in faith, in faith of Jesus for people to revert to. And that must have been difficult to commit to following Jesus without generations of faithful discipleship to look to. And so as a church, they're struggling. They're unsure of how to act in some circumstances and just plain making poor choices and living immorally. And in our passage, that immoral behavior has sparked an interest in the non-Christian community. As it does today, the church love or the press love a church scandal. Because when we publicly declare our faith in Jesus, it intrigues people. Our lives instantly go under the microscope. Friends and family will wonder how we're going to behave. They're analyzing our choices effectively judging to what extent, if any, we have been changed. And so they're watching us on a night out. They're listening to the language we're using. And they're aware of the jokes that we choose to laugh at. The reality is that some people will be waiting for us to fall. Because the moment we claim Jesus as our master, we are engaged in a spiritual battle where temptations will become even more shiny and attractive. And in Corinth, that battle is very real. Amidst the divisions and the idol worship, there's what we looked at in chapter 5, sexual immorality. And what drives Paul nuts is that it's being tolerated, borderline celebrated. And so those outside the church are looking in, they're saying, these folk are no different from us. 
In fact, they're worse. Their faith in Jesus appears to make no difference to how they actually are. Their words don't match their actions. So we need to remind ourselves constantly of how we are to be. And Paul, having visited them previously, now writes that he wants them to imitate him. It's really important here to understand that Paul is in no way putting himself in the place of Jesus. He's not trying to create a band of followers or a sect of some sort. If you take time to read Paul more widely, that's crystal clear. But in the next slide, if you could pop that, perfect, thanks. He says later in the chapter, in chapter 11, follow my example. But then immediately the caveat, as I follow the example of Christ. So Paul's not putting himself forward as an alternative to Jesus, rather than an example of how to follow. And he tells them he intends to visit again, but in the meantime, he's sending Timothy to remind them of the way of life of a follower of Jesus. What might we expect of Timothy? Surely he'll be a man wise in years, a person of high standing, a scholar of scripture. Well, that's what the world might expect, but it's not how Paul describes him. No, Timothy's primary qualification for the job comes down to one simple criterion. He is faithful in the Lord. Faithful in the Lord. The likelihood is that Timothy was younger than many of the church leaders in Corinth, and yet Paul sends Timothy because he is faithful which is to say that he stayed the course. In the face of temptation, he has proved trustworthy. And he is to set an example to them of what it means to be faithful and pure in conduct and speech. What a precious opportunity we have to be a Timothy, to gently lead others to walk in Jesus' footsteps. Because it's in the action of stepping out as a Christian that the learning really happens. No amount of head knowledge can actually replace living out our faith. We learn by doing, and often that involves copying others. I was thinking of the example of learning to Kaylee dance. You could have the best instruction manual in the world, and somebody behind you describing it audibly. But it's until you get up there, into that hurly-burly, and somebody takes you by the hand, shows you where to go, who to spin with, what's coming next. That's where the learning happens. Because our words are important, Jesus makes that clear. But perhaps of greater importance to him is the way that we act. That was why Jesus lived among his followers in his time of ministry. That's why there was the incarnation. Yes, it was to hear what he had to say, but just as much to see how he acted, the radical way that he behaved. And in Matthew, Jesus says, it's by our fruit that we are recognized. That's to say that it's by what a person does and the impact of those actions that we will discover the object of a person's worship. And so Timothy comes with the task of reminding them what it is to be a follower of Jesus and that there will be consequences for those who don't take the task seriously. We need reminding of who we are, the fallen state we're in, and therefore our need for our Savior, Jesus. That's why in the book of Acts, they're meeting daily to remind each other, breaking bread and fellowship. Because if we forget, we get tired and we lapse into old habits and practices. So we need discipline. Because if we fail to remember, our habits in Christ are replaced by the habits of the world that we're in. Foreign practices infect us, and then infect the church. And that's what's happened in Corinth, and it can happen to any church among us. Paul describes that infection as yeast, working through dough, and many times in Scripture, we'll find yeast representative of an evil influence of some sort. If I'm honest, I don't know an awful lot about yeast, 
But recently we got one of those outdoor pizza oven things. They were a big rage during lockdown as people started eating outside. And we've had a great time with kids and guests making pizzas and I'm trying to make my own dough. And that involves yeast. And on one occasion, I was sharing my dough making skills with my cousin and she's a proper baker, like a professional baker, makes beautiful uh, pastries. And I was telling her the process and she was wary of the amount of yeast that I was using. She told me that you actually know that you only need a tiny little bit of yeast, far less than the recipe was suggesting. Why, I asked. And she said, because of the way that yeast works. She then went on to describe how the yeast munches its way through the flour, devouring the sugars. If you remember the arcade game, Pac-Man, that's the picture in my head, munching its way through. And she told me that those little yeast microbes, they actually work harder when there's fewer of them. Her precise words to me were, and I wrote them down at the time, yeast creates a new culture over time within the dough. And I found that language really intriguing. That's what the Bible is getting at. That a little sin can influence an entire organization. That a little sin creates a new culture. And that's Paul's concern, and it's ours too, as we seek our church to be a place for people to learn safety, safely and follow Jesus. So there needs to be boundaries which are enforced by structures of discipline. And let's be honest, we don't like the sound of discipline. What I said at the start about being a parent, you don't excitedly choose to become a member of a fellowship, anticipating the administration of discipline. But we need it. Why? Because there will be a judgment. Not by the leaders of this church, not by the leaders of any church, but by Almighty God. But the church has a duty to prepare us for that judgment. And for the Corinthians, Paul is laying out two options in front of them. Shall I come to you with a whip or in love with a gentle spirit? Now let's explore this sensitively. Because there's no doubt that words in the Bible can be misunderstood and misapplied. That's happened in the history of the church and it's caused great hurt. And we can't ignore that. And yet we can't evade the choice. We can receive the warning, repent and receive love and a gentle spirit. Or we can remain in sin and receive a harsher judgment. And Jesus models that choice of discipline. Think, for example, of when our Lord was in his father's house and he saw the money lenders abusing the space. He didn't call out in a soft voice, say, oh, kindly stop that, would you? No, he picks up a whip and he drives them out. Does that make him any less loving? Absolutely not. That was a wake-up call to them. It lived in the memory, which is why we have it in our Bible today. But Jesus has an authority that we should not aspire to. Nor, but we do have a role to play. If we are to be people who administer discipline, we must take care. Constantly asking questions. What is the aim of this discipline? Who is being exalted in the process? And who is benefiting from the discipline? Let's just explore these briefly one at a time. What is the aim of discipline? Well, Paul is clear in our passage the purpose of discipline is to warn, to warn, to make aware, to shine a light upon sin and give a chance to repent. And that's really important. The passage tells us that the Lord will come to expose the motives of our hearts. That's terrifying to me. 
Because sin is serious. If we dilute sin, we make a mockery of Jesus on the cross. But in our highlighting of a sin, the purpose is not to be overly critical or condemning, but to grieve. Sin within a church should create a sense of mourning. We should be wounded and collectively hurt by it. And so discipline is to awaken, not to punish. And on the issue of who is being exalted, dangerous ground here, because it's not beyond us to conclude that a position we may have in the church allows us to administer a discipline that claims to exalt Jesus, but is actually a personal power trip. Discipline is never exercised for the satisfaction of the person who exercises it. Rather, it's always for the mending of the person who has sinned and always for the sake of the church. And so asking that final question, who is benefiting from the discipline, will help to uncover our motives, including the hidden ones. Because Jesus' way of working was always curative. Consider with me the story of John's gospel when Jesus meets the woman at the well. Is there a more beautiful interaction in the Bible? Here is a woman ostracized by society coming to gather water at a time of the day that will avoid her being seen by others and facing accusation. And she's made it to the well in peace. But then a man approaches her and her senses are heightened. After all, he doesn't, she doesn't appear to have been well treated by men up until this point. And he speaks to her. And he engages with her. And as he does so, it's obvious that his motives are different. He has an authority like no one else she has met. His words have power. And he highlights an aspect of her life that needs addressing and offers himself as the cure, making the extraordinary claim that he is the Messiah, bringing living water that leads to eternal life. Jesus is gently, but with all authority, illuminating a change that needs to happen. He awakens her to the sin that needs addressing. He offers her the cure. And she leaves a different person, sharing her testimony with the astounded villagers. Jesus alerted her to her situation and his discipline was not to break her, but to make her. And there's a model there for us to follow in how we deal with wounded people. There's no space for us to take any moral high ground because all have fallen short of the glory of God. Or in other words, people make mistakes. You can see these wee posters around Glasgow. That one's on Ashton Lane. And they are the work of a homeless charity. And they're wanting to remind us to refrain from judging people that we might see sleeping rough or begging. Because people do make mistakes. The woman at the well had made mistakes and you and I make mistakes. When we come to Jesus, we are justified, we're made right with God, but the process of sanctification can be rocky. And so lapses on that road are to be treated as wounds, protected and given time to heal. And we can all share that road of sanctification and support one another on it. It's what people discern term as discipleship, if you like. It's worth pondering that the words discipleship and discipline share the same root. It's a really beautiful thing to share a walk of faith with someone. I've been the recipient of that discipling myself, and I'm incredibly thankful for it. 
But here in Corinth, it seems the situation is beyond that kind of discipling. The immorality is infecting others and it needs to be cut out. The yeast is making a new culture and it's dangerous and it requires more radical action. Reminding and warning are prompts to stimulate a change, but if we choose to remain in sin, then there will be consequences. God is clear, he can't abide with sin. He cannot coexist with sin. The language of the Bible is pretty vivid on this. Deuteronomy says we must purge the evil from among you. There's not much wiggle room there. And here in Corinth, Paul's instruction is that the person is to be expelled. In stark terms, he says the person must be handed over to Satan. Meaning that the person is now to experience the fruit of their choices and have Satan as their master. I wonder if the Scottish phrase, you've made your bed, now lie in it, touches on that. And the language might seem harsh to you, and yes, it's harsh if we misunderstand Christianity, if we think sin isn't serious. If you're struggling with those phrases, if the tone of them makes you feel uncomfortable, please consider another story, the story of the prodigal son. Here's someone that chooses a path, a path which is exciting at the time, but it's full of danger. And the father permits the son to go. And so he lives for a while under a different master, Satan, the prince of this world. But in experiencing the false lordship that the devil promotes, the son eventually sees through the lies and temptations. The words of that passage tell us that the boy came to his senses That's what the purpose of expelling the person from the church in Corinth is, that he or she would come to their senses and find the forgiveness of our eternal father displayed in the welcoming arms of the local church. We can all have a role to play in that healing, in creating a space for someone to return to offer discipleship which illuminates the tender yet authoritative Savior Jesus. As we do that, let's be aware that it's our lives as well as our lips that proclaim our faith in Him. Our own walk with God can be the most obvious example to others, and yet it will be flawed best not to claim a purity achieved of our own making. Rather sit with a brother or sister in Christ and be thankful for a father who loves to forgive. Amen. Our final hymn acknowledges those times when we turn away from God, when we backslide, and yet it tells of us of a saviour who longs to heal us and bring us back to him. So let's sing now, O Jesus, full of truth and grace.
So I pray that you'll know God's blessing with you this week, that you'll be aware of his provision and his leading, and that your response would be to worship him. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen.